Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lauren Wenzel from the National Marine Protected Area Center, and I'm your moderator today. I wanna to thank our hosts at OCTO EBM Tools Network for um, helping us put this together. And today we're gonna to be talking about planning ocean uses in 3D. And I will introduce our speakers here in just a moment, but I will just want to remind you that uh, these webinars are really a chance to have conversations. So we look forward to your questions and comments through the question box. We're going to hear from both of our speakers, and then we will pause and start the Q&A process um, after they have completed their presentations. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mimi Diorio and Dr. Charlie Wally, both from the National Marine Protected Area Center. Uh, Mimi is the GIS manager for NOAA's Marine Protected Area Center and manages the MPA inventory, a comprehensive spatial database for US MPAs and is the lead for analyzing patterns and trends and reporting statistics for marine protected areas throughout U.S. waters. She is an active part of the NOAA GIS community, leads the National Ocean Service GIS team, and is dedicated to building geospatial capacity for NOAA data and tools. And when she is not at her desk, she teaches GIS at Cabrillo College in her hometown of Santa Cruz and is busy with her two young boys who sometimes make cameo appearances. Uh, <laughs> Charlie Wally is a marine ecologist with four decades of experience in ocean science and policy, focusing on coral reefs, MPAs, and ocean use planning. He joined NOAA in 1991, where he led science, education, and conservation programs for two major MPA systems, the National Marine Sanctuaries and the National Estuarine Research Reserves. And in 2000, Charlie helped found NOAA's MPA Center, where he served as senior scientist until he retired at 20, in 2020. So we're Really happy to welcome him back from his retirement desk. Um, while he was at the MPA Center, he served as NOAA's lead on coastal and marine spatial planning and was received three NOAA bronze medals for his work in ocean conservation. So welcome Mimi and Charlie, and I will turn it over to you two. Thanks for the opportunity, everybody. I'm gonna turn off my camera and get started and I'll turn the uh, controls over to Charlie halfway. So. Look forward to the conversation. So thanks for this opportunity to present today on our space use profiles work. Uh, when I began my career at NOAA, almost, I guess, 15 years ago now, I started working with Charlie and Lauren at the MPA Center. And Charlie then was already promoting ocean uses as an essential piece of the marine planning puzzle. And in the years since, we have worked with lots of different MPA colleagues together to create a series of data and tools that help us to capture and characterize ocean uses as they occur across the seascape to help us better understand and plan for not just the current uses of the ocean, but all the future ways that we will use the ocean and better understand their likelihood for interactions and their potential for conflict on the water. Before we get started, I just want to pause for a second and have you look at the image on the right and think about all of the ways that you use the ocean and that others that you know and industries use the ocean in so many different ways. And then realize that this picture of ocean uses is not static, it's always changing. And trying to understand and capture that dynamic nature of ocean uses on the water is a complex and challenging uh, piece of marine planning. So, the ocean is getting bigger, or busier, excuse me, it's not getting bigger, <laughs> maybe it is. Um, the ocean is getting busier and busier. Um, and this we know by literally just looking outside the window when you're um, living on the coast or, uh, or recreating on the shoreline. Um, there are more conflicts on the ocean, there are more uh, users engaging in different types of ocean uses. And so our, our interest in creating data and tools is so that we can understand how to capture this information and document and characterize ocean uses. We've recently published a paper, uh, a white paper that is available on our website and is linked here in our story um, that's known as the Guide to Building and Applying Space Use Profiles for Ocean Management. This document is derived from decades of work um, that involve stakeholders and various parts of ocean use community members and researchers and scientists to understand this piece of ocean uses and document it in a way that can be transformed and used for different geographies. This document is uh, a way to present a, co a conceptual framework that helps us to visualize and interpret uses. 
the, the space use profiles, which we will be focusing on today, um, are designed to be a flexible approach to thinking about and conceptualizing and visualizing ocean uses. This sounds, you know, a bit daunting because it is. It's actually very challenging to do this kind of work and to understand the various pieces of the puzzle and how to compare and contrast different uses across that are happening across the ocean. So this resource is a summary, I will note. It's a succinct summary of a much larger piece of work that we will refer to shortly. Um, and we will dig into in detail throughout today's presentation. So I encourage you to follow this link to learn more. Again, why ocean uses? I, I mentioned this um, up front, but we have a lot more people living on this planet and we have a lot more people living near the oceans and coasts and engaging um, in the ocean and coastal environments on a regular basis. And aside from the what you might think of of the recreational uses, there's so many industries from fishing and shipping, aquaculture, tourism, mining, energy production. And with new technologies, these, these uses are moving further away from their traditional operating areas. We have the ability to operate in deeper waters and to, to do new things on the water and in places on the water that we couldn't before. And ocean uses contribute significantly to social and economic benefits to our coastal communities and nation, but across the nation. And so this is an important part. We, we need to take this into consideration when we're planning for space use. And as we mentioned, this footprint is growing and it's, um, it's important that we start to grasp ways to understand these footprints of uses and manage them and integrate that information into the traditional structures for marine spatial planning. So this is something that I mentioned at the top of this is that since I started at the MPA Center 15 years ago, Charlie and I have been talking about how do we build data and tools to better understand and capture this piece of ocean use and integrate it into the marine planning infrastructure and decision making for marine planning. And so we've been working on this for a while and we have a lot of different tools that I wanted to highlight before we dig deeper into this space use profile. The first is a common language of ocean uses. And this seems like a very simple thing, which is a definition of all the different types of uses that are happening on the water. But actually when you start to think about ocean uses, it, it's actually much more complex than it sounds because there are so many different kinds. Sometimes they overlap in their definitions, knowing where to draw the lines between different types of uses and to document what these uses include and exclude can be challenging. And the thing that we've learned is that actually when you go to different places geographically, people consider different things to be involved in the activity of motorized boating. So what types of boats would fall into that category? And would a, would a, a kayak paddler with a motor on, on a kayak, would that be considered motorized boating or would that be considered kayaking? So understanding what these uses are, what they include and exclude, helps us to create a standardized way of speaking about use and actually characterizing um, these uses in a, in a comprehensive and standardized way. So this is a resource on our website that you can visit. And notice that this is a snapshot in time because these uses are changing. And the ways that we, particularly the ways that we engage in offshore uh, aquaculture and mining and minerals and various industrial activities is, is dynamic. And so that's something to consider when you, when you look at this list of the common language of ocean uses. So aside from the common language document, we also have a large tome of work on participatory mapping. Um, this is something dear to my heart that we've been involved with for quite some time, which is the development of a process to engage ocean users and community members to document ocean uses as they occur across the seascape. This requires um, this happens through a interactive process where we use GIS technology in, in workshops and online to document patterns of ocean uses and squeeze the knowledge of ocean users and stakeholders to get a better understanding of what kinds of uses are happening and where they're happening across the seascape. And from that, what we've done, and I'll note we've done this work throughout the U.S. Um, from the Caribbean to New England to the Pacific Northwest and the Hawaiian Islands work similarly. We've supported work in American Samoa, 
Um, so there's lots of examples of the work that engages communities to capture ocean uses data. And mo much of this data is available online. You can follow the link there on the marine cadaster hosted um, by our partners at NOAA, the um, Office for Coastal Management. And the culmination of so much of this work and brain power is, is, can be found in the Pacific Regional Ocean Uses Atlas project report. This project was um, a labor of love, I will admit, for many years um, that looked at documenting ocean uses across the Pacific Northwest and the Hawaiian Islands looking at, a, I think it was up to 28 different discrete ocean uses with the intent of mapping their uh, patterns across the seascape and using that information to, to start to better understand the likelihood of use interactions and the potential for conflict of uses, particularly in relation to offshore renewable energy. This work was, fun was funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and resulted in a very detailed report that documents ocean use patterns, as well as includes the space use profiles, which are the, the focus of our talk today. So the space use profiles document that I referred to at the beginning is the succinct summary of what the space use profiles are, but for a much more detailed um, reporting on the Pacific Regional Project and all of the background and data and maps and tools, you can refer to the report here. So while participatory mapping helps us document ocean use patterns and really does bring in that important part of stakeholder engagement, um, what it does is only creates a two-dimensional picture. I'm not gonna spend too much time on the graphics here, but these are some maps that resulted from the, the PRUA, the Pacific Regional Ocean Uses Atlas project that shows use patterns. And particularly for paddling on the left, um, it shows where the use is happening, where it's happening most dominantly is the dominant use color. And then on the right, you can see when you stack all of the uses together that we mapped, you can get a heat map that shows areas where we have dominant overlaps, so at areas where lots of uses are happening and they're happening a lot. And this can help prioritize planning and understand who the use communities are that are operating in these areas and might be impacted or influenced by any type of marine spatial plan. But what we get from that is only 2D, and it doesn't really help us understand, it tells us where the uses are happening, but it doesn't talk to us about use conflict or use interaction. And that requires a whole nother set of data and tools that is the focus of the work we're presenting today, which allows us to transform not just presence or absence of use, but to dig deeper and look at where uses might interact, what parts of the uses might interact, and what that might do for the influencing of conflict potential amongst uses. So getting from a 2D map of just simple shapes on, or simple shapes on a map to a three-dimensional understanding of space use is the space use profile. It is a, as I mentioned before, a conceptual framework. It is not a static answer, if you will. It is a way to think about, visualize and interpret uses consistently and com for comparison across a given seascape. I say a given seascape in that it is designed to be flexible. It is designed for someone coming in to do a marine plan of some kind or to analyze and understand ocean uses to adapt and modify to the way uses are occurring in any given geography. And this is a really important piece for helping us to get to that three dimensional. So I'm gonna pause again for a moment and I want you to stop and think about scuba. Scuba is the use we're going to highlight mostly throughout our presentation today. The, as I mentioned, the space use profiles have been developed for all, I think 28 different uses that are presented in the, in the PRUA report, but we're gonna highlight just a couple of those today with the predominant focus on scuba. And what I want you to think about is how when we, when you initially think about what scuba might entail, you might think it's a bunch of people swimming and with gear and checking out coral and whatnot in the water. And that's true. But it also involves lots of other components, other pieces of the use. So it's not just people with gear, but it's boats and anchors and chains and boats on the water, people in the water, buoys in the water, people on the vessels, vessels at harbor, and it also involves people on the shore. This is a, you know, when people are, are shore diving, you have people on the shore um, that are cruising out into the intertidal to scoop. So this is a way, when you think about all the different pieces, we wanna capture this 
all into one document that helps us understand how this use occurs and operates across the seascape. So the profiles that we will go through today, the sections of the profiles, there are six of them, we'll go through each individually and hopefully um, give you just enough information to tease you into reading more. Um, I want to note that, that this content is dense. There's a lot of information here. And so what we are going to try to do is give you that, that high level picture of what the, the profiles can do and how we develop them. And we encourage you to explore further on your own. So the six sections of the profile follow these six categories. The first is a general description, which is really just writing out what the use means and what it includes um, what activities are excluded or included in that description, where the use typically occurs, what pieces or parts, we call these functional components, it typically involves, and that really speaks to people and vessels and gear and infrastructure. And we also include any assumptions made in defining the scope of the use. And this can be really important. So I'll, I'll show you that as we get to the each section. Next section looks at three-dimensional space use, and it categorizes where use occurs across defined horizontal and vertical zones of the ocean. So it takes that idea of the 2D map and documents that through zones, um, not just across the horizontal, like our maps, our paper maps um, or Prua maps show, but actually also through the vertical zones. The next section is the space occupied by these functional functional components. So we don't just look at where the space or the use actually occurs across the water and through the, the water column, but we have to look at where each piece of that use, the people, the gear, the vessels, the anchors, the in infrastructure, where those pieces occur and across those horizontal and vertical zones. Moving further, we look at the importance of uses functional components. So we look at those people, vessels, gear and infrastructure, and we talk about what's the most important and essential to the successful pursuit of the use. And that helps us to better understand, again, where there might be uses interacting, what the components, what components might be interacting and where, and how this might lead to potential conflict. The final two sections of the profile Charlie will cover and really take what we learned from the first four and transform that to understand this interaction and conflict potential. We look at operational characteristics of the use, which is this scoring of how the use occupies space um, and how that relates to potential for conflict with other um, uses through interference and exclusion. We'll talk more about that shortly. Um, and then lastly, this is where the, it all comes together to score um, the potential for conflict based on how much a uh, use is dependent on place and how management can influence the potential for conflict for a given use and its interactions with other uses. So as I mentioned, it's a lot. These six steps, though, collectively create a product that help us to compare and contrast different uses and start to begin to understand where potential um, conflicts could occur. So I'll dig in to these first few and then I'll turn it over to Charlie to wrap it up. So section one is the general use description. Um, and this, this gets at what does the use generally entail and when, where does it tend to occur? And we focus on three fundamental pieces, the definition of the use, the location, and the components. So the definition is really just descriptive on, where this, um, on what this use includes and excludes. I'll give you an example in a second. The location speaks to where the use actually occurs that's the typical overall footprint, as well as the core operating area of the use, which is where the, the hot spot, if you will, of uses or where the use is most likely to occur. And then we, we dig into the, the functional components, which are the people, vessels, anchors, moving gear, and in, installed infrastructure, and where these components come in and if they come in with respect to that particular use. So again, it's a Think about, we're gonna keep talking about scuba, but scuba is people in the water, right? But it's also boats on the water and boats transiting from a port or harbor to the place where the scuba happens. And it's also the people in the water, the gear in the water, the infrastructure that's involved. So it's important to consider all of these pieces when we're trying to describe a use and characterize its full use uh, profile. So, 
I've already mentioned this, but this section does is the first introduction of the use components, and I've just showed you definitions of what those include. And, and this is important moving forward, particularly as we get into industrial uses and fishing uses, where vessels and installed infrastructure and moving gear play a much bigger part than perhaps in the scuba example. But I, I, I just wanted to show you here what the definitions of those components are. And if you look to the right over here, this is actually what section one of a, the use profile looks like. It defines the use in a set of sentences. Um, it talks about what it includes and excludes. It, it verbally defines what a footprint, where that use usually goes, and talks about the core activity area. So the dive site, right? The core activity area doesn't necessarily include the transit or um, the harbor, but is actually the site where the diving occurs. It speaks to what functional components are present and it provides any assumptions um, that, for instance, we're not talking about deep dives or saturation dives and assumes a typical dive profile with typical gear. So that's the first section, which really is just important for defining what we're what what use we're talking about and and disclaiming anything around that particular use. Section two is understanding the three dimensional piece. And this really gets at the question of where would a typical user likely go to pursue this use? And, you know, traditionally we think about use patterns as points on a map. This is where, for instance, on the left, this is a surfing example. It's just a point saying surfing happens here. Got it cross-sectionally, which is this is a traditional fishing activity, then and we look at it in cross-section. This doesn't really get at where a, the three-dimensional nature of a given use. And so what we really are trying to do is to combine this piece, which is what it looks like vertically and what it looks like horizontally, and capture that in a template that can be used with various different uses and compare and contrast that three-dimensional footprint. So we, we, we divided up the ocean into zones. Um, and I, I won't get into the details here, but you can see we have zones along the horizontal from the shoreline out to the oceanic realm, and we define what those mean, or oceans. And we do that similarly for the vertical zones, from the air to the sea surface, water column, seafloor, and seabed. Once we divided these all up like this, we then score each of those zones based on the likelihood of the use activity being conducted in that area. Um, and so, as you can see here in this table, which is in our report, and I'll show you graphically how this plays out in a moment, but we rank the core activity and the use footprint based on how likely the use is to actually be in that place and operating in that place. And we, and we add some disclaimers or notes that help to qualify that if it's, if it's somewhat confusing on the judgments we've made. And again, remember, this is SCUBA, but we've done this for 28 different uses and we can compile and compare and contrast across based on the information inside these tables. So the table is useful and interesting, but let's look at it graphically. And when you look across horizontal space and vertical space and you see your boat and your divers and your buoys and whatnot and your chains and your anchors, um, you can see that the near shore area is, is where the use is most often happening, both in the core activity and the use footprint. And similarly, in the vertical space, the use is most often and happening in the water column, but it's always happening at the sea surface. We have it sometimes in the air, if you have larger vessels, sometimes you have it with a, with a vessel on the sea floor, which is the seabed. Um, and, and similarly, we rarely have the core activity on the shoreline, but sometimes we have you know, shore divers that are occupying uh, the shoreline in the footprint. So interesting when you look at scuba, but then let's look at scuba compared to commercial fishing and renewable energy. You can see here, you emerge, uh, patterns start to emerge, is that if you have these uses co-occurring, um, where, where they're most likely to co-occur is in the coastal zone here, in the horizontal. Um, and when you look vertically, their most likelihood of occurrence is in the sea surface and the water column. So what this, allows us for not just a way to look at each use, but to compile all of the uses and look at where their likelihood of interactions are and better understand you know, how to prioritize planning 
to recognize this potential for co-occurrence. Section three then dives further into the functional components piece that I mentioned. And this is again about the pieces and parts of the use. So breaking down the use into these pieces and understanding where these pieces are operating and where they're required for successful pursuit of the use and ranking and rating them on their likelihood to be, um, be used in these, in these given zones. So again, remember the pieces and parts are we've got nets, we've got anchors, we've got vessels, we've got installed infrastructure, and we've got people in the water. So lots of different moving parts, if you will. Again, a way to, to visualize this is to uh, create cross-section and, and look at it in this vertical perspective is we've got, you know, with inf installed infrastructure for renewable energy, we've got ROVs, we have potential for helicopter overflights, we've got vessels, we've got, you know, these are the checking on the, on the wind turbines. And similarly, there's various different pieces when it comes to each use that if you look at it comprehensively, you can get a better understanding of how these components play out over three-dimensional ocean space. So again, I won't get into the table too much. You can have a look on your own, but this is a way when you take scuba snorkeling use and you apply this, uh, this template, you can start to understand where we have all these different functional components and where we don't. And as I mentioned before, it's useful to see that for one use, but when you compile it for multiple uses, you really start to see where not just the use has a potential to interact, but what pieces of the use have the most potential for interaction in a given zone. So it, and we can also start to think about the types of interactions that are the most uh, potentially hazardous. So while we, we don't get into that here, it is important um, to think about is that it's not just where two vessels might interact, but it, it would be, um, it, it think about where a vessel and a person in the water might interact. So we can start to get at what the nature of the conflict might be, not just the potential for conflict or interaction to occur. So again, have a look at this on your own, but you can see that we always have amongst all three of the uses in all five of their components, we all almost always or often have them operating on the sea surface. So the like the place where we're likely to see a lot in the in the vertical of interaction is on the sea surface. We also have the potential for most of those components to interact um, in the water column. And similarly, you can see emerging patterns in the horizontal where the coastal environment tends to be a real uh, hot spot for the, when you look at all of those overlapping uses. Um, but again, you can do this one use to one use, or you can do multiple uses or all the uses that are present in a given place. As I sort of alluded to above, the, the functional components aren't all equally important to every use. Um, and so section four goes from looking at all of the functional components to actually, to actually ranking them to which ones are the most important for the successful pursuit of the use. So again, this is another way to sort of filter down where if we have interactions and we have interactions amongst or potential interactions amongst parts of the use, what parts of the use are essential and that really aren't as flexible um, in thinking about mitigation and how we could better understand this conflict potential of one use to another. And we apply a primary, secondary, or an NA category to each of our principal or our functional components. We talk about you know, why that is. And, and then we, we graphically show this to show you that um, for instance, with scuba, people are the only primary component. All these other things aren't, they, they add to it, but they aren't always necessary for the use to occur. And if you do that again across all the different uses, you can start to see not only where we have the sea surface commonality of presence, absence, where these, these components are likely to be, but that we also have these are the primary components. So people are primary out of two of these. Um, but if we're going to have any types of interactions, it's going to be between installed infrastructure, moving gear, vessels, and people. And so this helps to 
as again, filter down and better understand not just the co-occurrence of uses, but what would likely interact given these uses actually being in the same place at the same time. And it's an important metric that helps us to sort of rank this potential for conflict amongst interactions and gives us more details on how planners can, uh, and operators can plan for and mitigate for potential use interactions. So with that, I'm going to turn over the controls to Charlie to follow up on the final two sections and wrap up on the space use profiles. So I will turn off my, uh, or turn on, I will go on mute. Hey, Charlie, you're on mute right now. Okay, great. Can you hear me all right? Yep, yep, you're all good. Okay, great. Thank you, Mimi. That was a great explanation of a very complicated story. Um, so let me zip up to this part. It gets even simpler when it goes by fast. Okay, so, so what Mimi told you in in an expert form was the who, what, where, and when of ocean uses in space. And then what we wanna cover briefly now is, is the how, um, and particularly how certain fundamental characteristics of ocean uses and how they're managed can influence or even directly dictate their potential effects on other uses. So this takes all those bits and pieces and maps of where they occur and don't occur and puts them into a context of how the use operates in 3D space, particularly in, on, under, and above the ocean, and how that affects other uses. And there are a lot of different ways to look at this, um, and we have chosen one that, that works and is consistent with the framework, but there are others that are also compatible. And basically what, what it does is it, it looks at uses like, for example, these oil rigs or the wind farm or even surfing or fishing and looks at how their inherent relationship to space and how that space is managed influences their interaction on other uses, for example, the wind farms in the sailboat. So there are shifting to operational characteristics of uses, which describe how it operates in the water. There are two fundamental characteristics that shape how it interacts with other uses. And those are two different types of conflict one exclusion, which is in effect precluding other uses from operating in that area due to the use is either permanence, it's, which is its long-term occupancy, for example, an oil rig or a wind farm that, while they may not be technically permanent forever, they're certainly there for a very long time and they're not likely to move, or buffer zones around those structures, which are not physical, structures but they're impediments to access by other uses so both of those uh, which often off operate in con in concert can result in exclusion of uses from the operating area of the first one the second which is a little different is interference which is impeding the successful pursuit of other uses due to either the operational use of the first use or the operational mobility, which means its ability to move itself around in real time or to proactively select an operating area based on short-term criteria. So you can think of a motorboat as being having high operational mobility and, mo and moving gear, which is the reliance of the use on attached and usually unresponsive uh, gear that's towed or pulled or pushed or lowered or raised in the water, for example, big fishing nets. So 
with uh, with moving gear, a high reliance on that often translates into a high potential for conflict with other uses because you have this thing in the water that you can't really move when you encounter other uses in the space. So in order to create the profile for this section, we ranked those criteria medium, low, medium, and high based on their relevance or importance to the use. And here's an example of what is probably the most extreme uh, illustration of the concept in the resulting pattern, which is renewable energy. And as you can see, it, it ranks highly in its potential to create conflict through exclusion by either its own permanence or the associated buffer zones that are often connected to these structures. And it ranks low in its potential for conflict due to interference because it it has um, it either through mobility, operational mobility, or through moving gear, which it typically does not have. So there, each use can be characterized in this way, which then allows you to start seeing how its fundamental characteristics contribute to conflict. Uh, so when you compare the three, for example, you can see it, it's a, sort of a complex checkerboard pattern, but it actually makes sense. So scuba has low potential for conflict due to exclusion from either permanence or buffer zones, because they're just not relevant to it. And it has medium potential for conflict due to, through interference, because it has usually some medium scale of operational mobility, as well as the relatively frequent use of moving gear. In uh, contrast, renewable energy has very high potential for exclusion due to permanence and buffer zones, as well as a potential for uh, interference and a low potential for moving gear. So it, it allows you to very quickly get a sense for not only what the use is likely to do in the water, but which of its fundamental characteristics, for example, permanence or moving gear, contribute to that potential for conflict. Um, you can take that same pattern, which has the four elements, and aggregate them into one measure of exclusion and interference, which then gives a, a fairly, uh, it, it's an interesting pattern and it makes sense that scuba has relatively low potential, and low to medium potential for conflict. Uh, fishing is in between and renewable energy is the highest. And, and again, this helps illustrate in a, in a relatively straightforward way, the, the consequences of how uses occupy or control their operating areas and the surrounding spaces, how they can or cannot proactively select operating areas in real time, and how they can control the behavior and location of their attached moving gear. So that that gives a, it, it kind of rounds out the picture on, on the profile by looking at the nature of the use and how it operates in the water. And the last section, section six, asks a similar but really quite different question, which is how are these uses managed in ways that could potentially result in their conflict or not with other coexisting uses? And the, the thing to keep in mind here, and, and we all know it, but I think we sometimes forget it in the planning context is that you know the oceans are constantly being referred to as vast endless etc and they are in some ways as in a practical level but they're not homogeneous when it comes to their value to ocean uses and without a better way to look at this mosaic of use specific value across ocean space we'll be um, continuing to have this this complicated process of trying to plan ocean uses, which I think to, to date has been um, difficult to say the least. So in section six, we highlight 
two drivers of conflict in, in ocean uses, one environmental and the other governmental, that dictate how flexible and how many options an ocean use has for selecting its operating area, and therefore, through that selection, avoiding conflict with others. And those two drivers are site dependence, which is simply the uses requirement for a specific area because of environmental, usually, features that it possesses that are critical to its pursuit. So think oil and oil rigs. And spatial management, which is the degree to which the, the area, the operating area, is constrained or dictated or controlled in some way by authorities or binding agreements. And again, that applies most in the most extreme case to installed infrastructure, but it also applies to some degree for activities like fishing, both of which tend to be also highly site dependent. So site dependence as a driver for conflict can, can constrain operating areas and through that can set up conflict with other uses. And the reason for that is that some uses are heavily reliant on specific operating areas because of their uh, natural resources or operating conditions or whatever. And those include things like shipping lanes, uh, fishing in many cases, surfing, interestingly enough, which is, as you might expect, concentrated in places where the surf is good. And other uses show the opposite trend where they're more flexible and where they can be pursued in real time. And those include common activities like kayaking and swimming and sailing to some extent. And so you, you have an overlay on top of these other patterns of, of uh, use and conflict of how the management of the use can result in or maybe avoid conflict. So spatial management takes into account the fact that some uses are effectively not regulated. They're, they can operate freely across ocean space. They have few restrictions on operating areas, while others are managed pretty strongly and their, their locations are controlled directly by the agencies. And those include things like spatially managed areas like offshore energy, shipping lanes, and a lot of fisheries. The less heavily managed air uses include things like scuba, boating, and kayaking. So when we depict those, those characteristics in the profiles, we again use the high, medium, and low relevance scale. And we assign to each use the degree to which it's site dependent, with high dependence usually meaning high potential for conflict and for spatial management with high degree of spatial management, meaning high potential for conflict in the sense that if a use is assigned to an area by some authority, then other uses are precluded from that area to some extent. So you can combine these two and you begin to see how the inherent characteristics of uses can affect their, their operation in space and their, their interactions with others. So here, it, looking at our three example uses, scuba, uh, uh, non-commercial fishing with benthic mobile gear and renewable energy, you see the, the pattern of conflict due to either site dependence or spatial management. And again, scuba is, either medium to low in, in its potential to uh, have adverse interactions with other co-occurring uses. Fishing is somewhat in the middle and renewable energy has in, in this analysis high potential for conflict due to its uh, total reliance on certain operating areas and its high, very high degree of spatial management. So th these these two features added the how part to the what, where, when part give us a, a comprehensive picture of how, how the uses actually operate 
and what that means for space use planning in, in all kinds of different um, contexts. So what we end up with, and th so this is the, the culmination of sections one through six. For each use, the profile includes all of these sections, which Mimi described up to section four, and I just described section five and six. And here are two uses compared. And, and you can see just even just visually, you can get important and interesting insights into how the uses operate and how they might relate to each other. So, so why do this? Uh, clearly, it's a lot of work. It was even a whole lot more work to develop this framework. But what it allows us to do is to combine descriptions and definitions of the space use of any particular human use of the ocean with these two considerations of their conflict potential and use that in insight into understanding how it operates in the three dimensions of space and how it relates to other uses. So you could think of this, I was trying to think of something that isn't ocean related that might help put this in perspective. And, you know, I, I and Mimi live in California. We have mountain lions here and there, and they're of great interest to people. And what, what the profiles allow us to do is go beyond the kind of knowledge that you get about mountain lions in, a, in an old timey natural history museum where there's a stuffed cat looking majestic and fearsome, but it, there's not a lot of information that you can use to the kind of insight you would need if you were walking on a trail and you came across one. And then the stuffed animal thing doesn't really give you much. But what you really want to know is what's its range? Is it territorial? Does it have cubs nearby? Is it hungry? Is it going to chase me? All those things that you don't know otherwise. And that's what the profiles give you is a sense of the, the, the nature of the use as it relates to other uses. So what, what can you do with that? Um, you can do a lot actually. And, and we think there are probably even things that we haven't anticipated. The first and probably most fundamental is that you can visualize and integrate what's largely been invisible to now in the three-dimensional footprint of ocean uses and in their distinct functional components throughout their operating areas from the shore all the way out to the open ocean and from the air to the seabed. So now it's, it's possible and I think important and in some ways maybe uh, inescapable to think about uses as a three-dimensional moving living breathing thing in the ocean and that that's really quite different from what we typically do it also allows you to look at the uses in with, with a different lens which is to deconstruct them and that's with the functional components and to characterize the space requirements and the potential implications of each of those functional components as they relate to other uses and as they may contribute to uh, adverse impacts to either uses or to the ecosystems they're operating in. And that, that's a big thing. Um, the, the next one is probably, in, in some ways, I think maybe the most important is that incorporating these insights that we have into how the uses operate and how they're spatially constrained can inform manage, place-based management decisions in ways that can minimize conflict. And this is important, optimize their value among other uses. So this isn't all about avoiding conflict. It's also about maximizing getting the most out of a use in the area it needs to be. And finally, the these profiles and, and Mimi stressed this too, and, and it's just fundamentally important, is that these are these are they're frameworks. They're a flexible tool which 
we not only encourage people to customize to their local uses, but it will only work if you do that. So as Mimi mentioned at the beginning, when we were talking about defining uses, they're really variable. And, you know, one person's kite fishing is, is somebody else's, you know, recreational kite flying. And so you really have to start from the beginning with the, your uses as they're pursued in your area, with your planning process and its goals, and then tailor the profiles to them. But what you get in the end is a powerful tool to let you see and evaluate and, and uh, assess these uses in ways that we haven't done really very much before. So, so what good is this? What, how, how can we use these abilities uh, with the three-dimensional x-ray vision to actually improve ocean management? And, and we present here three um, ways to do that. There are probably hundreds that are only limited by your imagination and by your situation. The first is, is marine protected areas where the profiles can inform both the design of, of sites and their adaptive management, particularly of, of schemes to zone MPAs in ways that minimize conflicts among allowed uses. And that's actually, uh, it's not very common yet, but I think as we move forward, that, that will become increasingly part of the MPA uh, toolbox and something that this ability is designed to enhance. Similarly, um, the profiles were de designed and largely in, in reality to um, inform marine spatial planning by providing an objective three-dimensional view on the holistic requirements of operating space needed for these uses and needed to understand in order to allocate them to areas across very large and very heterogeneous ocean spaces. So this, this gives us more tools to answer the question of where are appropriate areas to site uses so that they're uh, impacts on the environment maybe are limited and their conflicts with others are also limited. And then finally, and this is a, this is a different twist, but it, it's potentially in the future, one of the more important um, outcomes of, of this work is by looking at the, at the functional components, it becomes clear that that's where a lot of the problems so-called lie. So when you look at the source of conflict, it's not the whole use, the thing itself, you know, the idea of an oil rig. It's the fact that it's a thing in the water that boats can run into. And more importantly, it's a pipe on the bottom that nets can get hung up on. And similarly with wind turbines and, and other uh, structures. So the profiles allow us to deconstruct and untangle all that look for the areas where there, there is a component that is likely to interact with in a negative way with other uses or their components in specific places in space. And that leads one to think about ways that the component itself could be redesigned to minimize those risks or the way we use the component redesign to make them less problematic. So this, this is sort of an R&D call to action in the future, but I think it's one that, that merits some attention. So all this is, is just a very complicated way of trying to make sense out of what's going on in the ocean and especially in what you can't see. And we hope that this will be seen and used and appreciated as um, a way to transform the intuitive into the useful. And by that, we mean that, you know, that you, you are probably already thinking, you already intuitively know all this stuff, and we do. And we, you know, when you think about an oil rig, you think about the structure, and if you think a little harder, you think about the pipes and all that. But 
we don't, to date, we've not had uh, consistent and repeatable and quantifiable ways to turn that intuitive gestalt of a use into a set of criteria and data and patterns and insights that help us manage them. And that's what we hope this will do. It also creates and provides a lens for us to envision ocean uses in three dimensions, which is uh, also intuitively relatively easy, but in practice, not so much. And then finally, it, it's intended, and we hope it serves as a as a step forward for us to craft a more harmonious place for oceans to do what we do in the ocean, people to do in the ocean. So uh, we want to thank you very much. And then finally, we, we do not want to miss thanking our colleagues on the Space Use team, uh, in particular, Julia Townsend, Jordan Gass, and Hugo Selby, who uh, slaved away forever working this up and um, did most of the heavy lifting for which we were greatly, very grateful. So that's it. Um, uh, Mimi and I will be happy to answer questions if you have any. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. You want to turn your camera on? And yeah. uh, we do have time for a few questions. First, I will note that a couple of folks asked for the presentation to be shared. And so I did go ahead and put the link to the story map in the um, in the questions. So hopefully you all have seen that. But um, but it was intended to, to be a great resource for you following this, this presentation. So um, there is a question, do you look at uses on the high seas as well as uses near the coast? And can you talk about the applicability of this to the high seas? Well, I, I, I'll take a crack at it and, and then Mimi should jump in too. Um, we, th this framework can be applied really anywhere. Uh, obviously, when you get that far out, a lot of those characteristics and variables are no longer relevant, but uh, it can be used to, to look at uses in their operation and their potential conflicts in the high seas. And we have a question that asks, how are the likelihood of occurrences for different activities compiled? Were they through the literature or, or other sources? <laughs> Do you want to do that one, Mimi? No. Okay. All right. So, so this this gets at one of the reasons why this took a very long time to do, because and, and why we believe it, it's it's uh, novel, because there's very little information, especially at that when we started, about any of this. There's no book that says, okay, here's the three-dimensional footprint of, you know, fishing with poles. So we, in order to fill that knowledge gap, we used uh, expert advice from people involved with these activities. We, you know, used, there were some publications that were useful, but it was mostly looking at uh, web resources about those activities. And then we had a group of people that we used as advisors to basically double check our assumptions. And probably most importantly, we were really conservative and very careful about how we defined uh, our assumptions, what we left in, what we left out, and how we made the decisions. Now, they, we were fully expecting that you know, some percentage of the way we characterize some of this stuff is not accurate and certainly not in specific places because the use has changed so much from place to place. But that's kind of the whole idea, is this, is this is designed to be a way of thinking about asking that question. And then you take that to your backyard and you answer the question. And, and we do have a comment from one of our uh, uh, audience members who suggests the idea of an app where users could validate a profile in a particular place, which is kind of a cool idea. Yeah. And then I want to sneak in one more question uh, first, a comment. I am an architect turned marine spatial planner. These presentations highly satisfy my need for 3D visualizations of the sea. So, thought you'd like to hear that because that was definitely the intention. Yeah, um, thank you. 
And a last question, um, have you thought about integrating this into something like the Ecological Marine Units Framework for 3D Representation? Uh, and there's a website given. I don't know if you all are familiar with that. Yeah, that's the Esri three-dimensional view of various different parameters across the marine seascape. Um, so it allows you to drill down and look at, you know, uh, salinity and temperature and dissolved nitrates and whatnot across the entire, you know, the global ocean. And yeah, I think this would be an amazing tool to to be able to integrate in that three-dimensional way. It's really the data are so variable from place, place to place and are highly um, interpreted. So it wouldn't be something that's static. It needs to be more fluid. And so the app idea where we could build an app where folks could actually populate that profile um, uniquely based on a geography, and then that could feed into a three-dimensional um, model would be very cool, uh, especially for the visualization piece and the additive of different uses piece so that you could add all those different uses in there and see three-dimensionally how they play out in three-dimensional space. And there are some suggestions about um, adding in biological information, ecological information, but in general, just uh, lots of interest in the tool and uh, we do have to wrap up. So I just wanna thank Charlie and Mimi for their great presentation and also to all of you for joining in today. And uh, I did put the link to the story map in the, in the chat, we can also send it out following this presentation to everyone who participated. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.